You might recognize my first guest today from 2015 film The Big Short. Greg Lippmann is here in the studio and he was the head of global asset back securities trading at Deutsche Bank, where he famously and successfully bet on the collapse of the housing market leading up to the global financial crisis. Today, Greg is the founder and chief investment officer at Libermax, an asset management firm with $10.2 billion in assets under management. Greg founded the firm Libermax in 2010, specializing in a broad range of securitized products, including asset-backed securities. So Greg, welcome. It's so great to see you here today. Thank you for having me. Uh, it's good to see you. And Greg, I know you've been in this world of securitized products and asset-backed finance for 30 years. So my first question to you is, why structured products? Why structured credit? Why does that belong in a client portfolio, especially in a private wealth client portfolio today? Sure. Well, first of all, why structured products? Structured products are super important for the financing of Americans, right? If you have a, a car loan or, or mortgage or you have credit card debt, almost, almost certainly that debt is in, is in some securitization. So without securitizations, it will be harder for Americans to borrow money in general. So it's going to be with us you know, forever, notwithstanding the changes since the great financial crisis. As it relates to why it should be in a person's portfolio, I think now is a particularly good time for the product for two, two, two high-level reasons. One, in the wake of the great financial crisis, which, you know, as people often hear, governments fight the last war, we had a situation where people felt that aggressive lending to consumers, packaged into wacky financial products, sold to levered institutions, like, caused a great financial crisis, right? So the government said, we're not going to ever have this again. Mm -hmm. We're going to regulate lending. We're going to create things like the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, and we're going to make it harder for people to borrow money. We're going to have people borrow money fixed rate instead of floating rate more than they ever had before. That's point one. Yeah. Point two, so the fundamentals of the product are much better than they used to be because of these regulations. The capital charges compared to before the great financial crisis are two and a half to five times higher than they were before. And so that means there's permanently less demand for the product. So the product is both fundamentally cheaper than it used to be relative to corporates. And when you combine that with the current and likely continued high interest rates, fixed income and specifically spread fixed income like structured products offers a healthy yield in a world where equities are a bit more uncertain, the returns. Right. And the yield that we're talking about is in the low double digits. It's highly dependent on each securitization you buy and where you are in the capital structure and the duration and the liquidity. But in, at a high level, our portfolio yield is in the low double digits. Right. And when you look at things like high yield bonds, for example, pure high yield bonds, the yield to worse on that is probably now, you know, eight maybe 9% depending on the month, but you know, clearly you'll pick up potential there and sounds like it's safer or more well, better risk managed uh, securities today versus what they were during the financial crisis. But to go back to the financial crisis, obviously you successfully, as I mentioned, bet um, against the housing market and you, know, you were essentially betting against these very securities that you're now thinking about buying. So what's changed today? What's the opportunity set for you now in securitized products? Sure. You know, lending before the great financial crisis was extremely aggressive. Uh, people had high loan-to-value first mortgages. They often had a second mortgage after that. And they had most, mo more than half of mortgages in the country were floating rate. So people were very levered and very exposed to, to, interest, rate, to interest rate changes. Today, 95% of the mortgages in this country are fixed rate. 66% um, of Americans own their own home. 80% of the mortgages in, in America are 5% or lower today. Mm -hmm. So you have a situation at, at this time where more than half of Americans are earning more on money markets than they're paying the bank. And when you think about a bank, the whole point of a bank is they pay people less for their deposits and they charge people to borrow. And it's the key reason why we haven't had a recession yet is because U.S. consumer is very resilient and that's, that's an outgrowth of these legislative changes. So. Um, I think we were able to create a portfolio that participates in bull markets and has a resiliency between the yields of the portfolio, which enables hedging, and the place in the capital structure and the fundamentals of the loans, that it's going to be resilient in downdrafts. Right. And when we think about the broad securitized product space, it's about $19 trillion, and some of that includes the ABA asset-backed securities that you mentioned that are backed by some of those consumer loans. But then there's the corporate side of that, and then there's the commercial real estate side of that. So the commercial mortgage-backed securities, the CLOs. So if you were to think about the risks that are lurking in the economy today, fine, the consumer is resilient. Fine, the consumer can stomach the 5.5% interest rate, but can the leveraged loan issuer can the commercial real estate operator, can they continue to operate with this level of rates without defaulting? It's a great question. And I think ultimately, um, when we go into the next recession, and whenever that might be, it's going to be led by the corporate sector. I think the corporates, similar to what happened in 2000, the 2000 to 2002 time was a period where corporates 
were under a certain amount of a correction uh, after the first internet bubble. And the U.S. economy was, was pretty resilient. The consumer sector, we had a brief recession in 20, 2001. And, and equity markets struggled for those three years, and, and structured products markets did fine because at a high level, our product is driven more by unemployment versus other things. Well, let's expand on that a little bit. So, you know, when we see a jobs report that's stronger than the market expectations, the knee-jerk reaction in the equity markets is to move lower because presumably the Fed is not going to cut rates. But what does a strong labor market mean for your portfolio? Uh, and do you see that strength continuing? You know, all assets are, are linked at some level. And while there's certainly stocks that go up when most stocks are going down and, and whatnot, in an environment where the equity market is selling off, there's definitely going to be downward pressure on, on our long portfolio. But in the long run, we're driven by do people pay their mortgages back or not. In the short run, we're driven by just market sentiment more broadly. And so if unemployment stays low, defaults on these securitizations are going to stay low and they're going to be resilient. How concerned are you about the risks there? You know, do you think it's well enough talked about to where it's already in the price, or do you think there's more of a downdraft? Everybody knows that commercial real estate is a problem, that work from home is going to be a part of reality forever. That's not a secret, and that's in the price. And when you think about it as an investor, it's all about reality versus expectation. So if you think of like some of these tech stocks, if you think they're going to, they're going to do great, the only way their stock's going to go up is if they do amazing. And mm -hmm. certainly some stocks have continued to, to defy expectations and it's done better. Yeah. But there's not a lot of room to do better than great. Conversely, people think that commercial real estate, specifically office, is going to be horrible. And if you, if you can buy something to horrible, the only way you're going to lose money is if it turns out to be atrocious. <laughs> but if it's, if it's bad or mediocre, you're going to make a lot of money because you, you bought it assuming it was going to be horrible. And we think you know, that a lot of this has been very priced in. Secondly, you know, an adage that I'm sure most people have heard, real estate is local. And you look at New York City as an example, Park Avenue rents are 50% higher than, than Lex, and Lex is 50% higher than, than Third. So even though rents are going down, you now have a situation where somebody who used to be on Lex says, ooh, I can afford to be on Park now. So what's really happening in, in real estate is the best real estate is totally fine. The middle real estate is being buffeted to an extent. And the, and, and the sort of BC quality buildings are getting really hurt very, very badly. But the sector writ large has this negative connotation on it that you can buy those sort of, you know, A minus properties mm -hmm. to horrible expectations. Right. And that's the pricing that you see on some of those securities. And to that end, you know, there's no exchange for, you know, securitized products. You know, there's no ticker. There's no, no you know, intraday fair value that you can see on the asset class. So talk about how you have the ability to create value for investors, for shareholders, you know, not only through the income component, but also trying to figure out what is the right price to pay for this. Sure. It's a great point. I mean, it's one of the reasons that, that this product does belong in people's portfolios because it's not something you can do at home. Unlike equities where all the information is free, in our space virtually all of it costs money. So not only do we have to pay for the data, but we have to hire people that can do things with that data. So that's point one. And then point two is because it's an over-the-counter market, there are times where the only people that know something is for sale are the three people that the bank called. So it's important to have relationships that people call you. It's important to have the investment in data and technology and, and, and investing team that you can respond quickly enough to situations that people will, will call you quicker than other people because they know they're going to get or that you may give them a fast answer. And we're, we're plenty of times where we've been able to buy things at we think are, are really, really cheap levels because the markets are are opaque and, and not everyone is seeing the flows. And just give us the flavor of how wide can the spread be, you know, between price A versus price B for the same asset? Well, there's two answers to that. One is the, the people who are making the markets and those markets are more narrow than the range of markets, meaning if, if two people are making a two-point market and one of those people is making the market 78.80 and the other person is making it 58.60, is the market 5880 or is there a two point market? Just depends mm. on which two points we're talking about. So, so markets tend to be much wider than corporates uh, and equities, but, but if you're a, an educated investor and you can talk to a lot of counterparties, you can narrow that spread a lot and sometimes you know, buy things from people at prices that are less than other people are willing to buy them from you. You know, I'm sure there's a lot of misperceptions, misconceptions about your market. So what would you say are some of the biggest misunderstandings about this? Yeah, well, one is that, that it, it blows up every few years because people know what happened in 2008. And I think it held in the right hands. You know, it does better. Um, two, that because it's so complicated, it's better to just avoid it, right? There's a saying, you know, invest in what you know. But our product, because we would get into the weeds, it would take, a, we'd have to have an hour, two hour interview to get into why we like different bonds and why we don't like other bonds. That's beyond the, the, the sort of understanding 
of, of, of most investors. And so you have people who say, I'm only investing in the thing I understand. And so the result of that is our product is chronically under supported by investors. And the fact is, it's been since the global financial crisis that it doesn't actually blow up every couple of years. But in the meantime, it does uh, showcase some economic resilience. And especially in today's market environment, where you have strong consumer and this uh, sort of insulated from the industry environment economy, that is quite supportive for the asset class. Yeah, that's right. I agree. Well, Greg, with that, thank you so much for your perspective and thank you for breaking down parts of this uh, interesting and fascinating and important uh, securitized product market for us. And, you know, I'm taking away from this that investors can be looking to the space for a pretty significant yield opportunity of low double digits. Uh, you also have the resilience in various economic environments. And of course, today, with a solid consumer backdrop, uh, this is an asset class certainly worth looking at. So, Greg, thanks so much for your time today. Thank you.